Welcome to Quantum Mechanics, a powerful framework for understanding the universe. Hi everybody, welcome back for more self-adjoint operators. So what I want to do in this lecture is talk about the, th the three most important self-adjoint operators that we're going to uh, encounter for a while. So. I first need to define them as operators and then to prove that they're self-adjoint according to the definition we just had. So these are going to be the position and momentum operators and afterwards I'll define energy, the energy operator, because we need position and momentum uh, to define energy, kinetic energy and potential energy. Okay, so the, we're going to start off with a definition of three dimensions, so x lowercase x, now this is important, lowercase x and lowercase p are the position coordinates and momentum coordinates in three dimensions. Uppercase x and uppercase p are the position operators and momentum operators. So we consider psi as a complex valued function defined on defined on three-dimensional space, lowercase x, the position operator is nothing more than multiplication by the component corresponding to which co whichever coordinate we're interested in. So the position operator in three dimensions has three coordinates, x1, x2, x3, or xi, xj, xk, however you want to index things. So xj acting on psi of x is lowercase xj. It's, it's just multiplication by the um, coordinate. Okay, the momentum operator is a little bit different. The jth component acting on the same function is h bar over i. And this is where you can often get confused with i, the, the imaginary unit and index. I'm pretty careful about that, and, and I don't think I, I do that in any place. Use I for both. So, so it's h bar over I times the partial derivative of xi with respect acting on psi of x, the function, the complex valued function of three dimensional space. Now, okay, so you have a few, so that's an operator. It takes a function and gives you another function. Um, are they linear? I said that uh, differentiation is linear and we're familiar with that. This one actually is probably not a little bit more confusing, the uh, position operator. Why should that be linear? In the margin notes I have a little proof of why it's linear and it's useful to go through because it makes you really pay attention to linearity in the definition. So please go through the margin note and if it doesn't make any sense, ask me about it. So in one dimension, there's not an x, x1, x2, x3 operator, p1, p2, p3, all uppercase for operators. These are just the one dimensional position momentum operator. So the functions that we're considering to have for these operators to act on is a space of square integrable functions and if you, you can compute their norms using the definition of the norm, I'm going to go back to it because remember we had a norm, we had an inner product on the space L2, and the norm was the square root of the inner product. So this is the norm squared here. So pay attention to this. This this sorting these little details out will solidify this for you. So let's prove that the position operator in one dimension, let's do these for one dimension. If you can do it for one dimension, you can do it for individual components of three dimension. In fact, it's in the, it's in the problem book. Okay, so the inner product of x phi with psi, we compute that. And then what are we trying to do? We're trying to show that that's the same as the inner product of phi with x psi, because that will mean we have proven x to be self-adjoint. So we just go through a line of calculations. What is x 
acting x operator acting on phi it's now keep the, your your complex conjugates in place it's the complex conjugate of x acting on the complex conjugate of 5x because uppercase x is just multiplication but look at this x is a re space is real so the complex conjugate of little of lowercase x is just itself it's a scalar we can move it around we leave 5x alone and lo and behold the lowercase x multiplies psi of x it's just the same in the integral and that comes from keeping our complex conjugates correct okay now the momentum operator is a bit more complicated we have to do a bit of integration by parts which we do a lot of integration by parts in quantum mechanics so let's start off in the same way the inner product of operator p acting on phi with psi okay what is that well the operator p is just h bar over i i haven't said what h bar is yet but it's a constant that's all you need to worry about d phi dx with a complex conjugate over the top multiplying psi of x okay now we do the integration by parts because remember integration by parts enables us to switch the d by dx off uh, on from from acting on the phi to the psi that's a good way to think of integration by parts. Okay, so we pulled out h bar over i with a complex conjugate. We get a minus sign because of the complex conjugate of i is minus i. We do integration by parts and we have these boundary terms. Uh, okay, but let's ignore them for the moment. And look at what we've done. We've done exactly what we wanted to do. And we have the h bar over i with a minus. Go to the next line. And if those boundary terms were gone, if they vanished at infinity and plus and minus infinity, we would just be left with phi, inner product of phi with p psi. But in quantum mechanics, we're going to work with functions that vanish at infinity. And we're going to that we're going to require that for physical reasons. For normalization, for one thing, or the integrals won't exist. So some details here, but these are great calculations to understand how to do. And these calculations, I've actually put them on exams in the past. Finally, let's look at the Hamiltonian operator. Think of Hamiltonian as total energy. In classical mechanics, Hamiltonian was kinetic energy, p squared over 2m, for a single particle, plus v of x. Okay? We're going to have the same thing in this case, but we're going to substitute operators for the usual momentum and positions. And that's the Hamiltonian operator that we have here. The Hamiltonian operator acting on psi is the momentum operator plus multiplication of the potential energy acting on psi. And that's all it is. Well, I say all it is. I mean, the journey to that realization was some journey. Now, is it self-adjoint? Yes, it is. Why? Well, we take the, the adjoint of kinetic plus potential, and one of the properties we're going to prove is the adjoint of the sum is the sum of the adjoints, and the adjoint of the product of the operators is, is the product. And we've already proven that P is self-adjoint, so kinetic energy is pretty easy. But now, what about potential energy? Ah, uh, well, does this equal this? So that the potential evalu energy evaluated on the adjoint of the position operator is equal to the potential energy evaluated on the adjoint. We're going to... introduce that as an assumption for the potential energy functions that we look at. Okay. So this is useful. I went through this rather quickly, but it's useful to think about. We're going to come back to it over and over. We're going to think about Hamiltonians, kinetic plus potential energy. That's all that means if you didn't have classical mechanics 2 in the second year. And we're going to take those functions and we're going to replace coordinates of momentum and, and position with the corresponding quantum mechanical self-adjoint operators. And then we're going to do what? 
Oh, that's coming. That's coming. So, hopefully, this made some sense to you. This concludes most of the section in Chapter 1 on self-adjoint operators and, um, and eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But in the next section, we're going to introduce Dirac notation. And we're going to redo all of this stuff in this really cool notation, which is built for adjoints and inner products. And we're going to go back and derive many more properties of um, self-adjoint operators, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, adjoints, and so on. So that's it for today. Keep safe, everyone, and I will see you soon. Bye.